Today, uh, Lena has agreed to talk to me and I'm really, really pleased to have you. So thank you so, so much for making time to talk to me. Richard, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm the one who should be starting by thanking you. <laughs> well, you know what? You reached out to me on Facebook to talk to me about something. And I was, I was like, well, why don't we just talk about, you know, what we're doing with languages and your projects? Because I, I follow you, obviously, on, on social media, on Instagram. And what strikes me about you is just how you combine things together. I mean, I, I, and this has been a journey. So just sort of to preface, preface all of this, we really sat down to talk properly the first time, I think, was probably in the polyglot conference in Ljubljana right yeah mm -hmm. and we did that interview together in <laughs> multiple languages and I'll pop a link to that uh, in the description so uh, people can find it and we talked about language learning and all that kind of stuff and what we do and how we did it mm -hmm. and um, and that was a lot of fun but following you over the last few years actually what I've noticed is you're not just languages languages pure languages you actually combine other interests that you have and I get asked very often what do I do with languages is it enough do I need to think about other things and and I think probably you're a good person to talk about a very different dimension so just let me know what's going on in the background with the sort of your posts and what you're talking about I'd love to know more well I think let me preface this with kind of you know going back back to the beginning I guess and for me I actually never considered language learning to be difficult. And then I think as I got older and older, so I started learning when I was a child and I kind of got into why well, I discovered that a lot of people thought languages were, were something difficult, that you needed talent. And for me, I always, as a child and as I continued through school and, and university, I always combined my languages into the things that I did. And that kind of came naturally. And then I discovered, wow, okay, this is something not everybody does. So, you know, for example, when, when I started dancing in Adelaide in Australia, I did like German, like traditional German dancing. And there were people speaking German and they did a lot of those sessions in German. So I thought that was a beautiful part of my life where I had a hobby and I got to practice my language. And I started to do that more and more. I would get like part-time jobs where I could learn a little bit of, of, like Lebanese Arabic because my boss was from Lebanon and then Italian because the other boss was from Italy. So I've always just found and continued to, to keep up my motivation for languages because I've, I've found an area of my life that I'm super passionate about and kind of intertwine all of those things. And I think in, in terms of, you know, my journey and, and how my language career and, and life has developed and evolved is I think I just never wanted to settle for being put in one box and mm -hmm. I think nobody should. And the more, you know, I've put out content and I've shared my passions and I've shared my experiences. I've had a lot of people say the same where they think this is something I've struggled with where I don't know how to combine these different areas of my life. You know, I'm a mom, but I'm also a teacher, but I'm also a yoga instructor and, I've, and they feel like they need to choose. And I don't think you need to choose. So that's why, you know, a lot of the content that I post is really deep rooted in, well, deeply rooted in psychology, it's deeply rooted kind of in spirituality as well. And just almost, I want to give people the permission to be able to be their most authentic self. And that means not needing to choose or not feeling like you need to choose between being passionate and saying, yes, I am passionate about languages and I'm learning this and this and this and or I'm a teacher or I'm a polyglot whatever title you want to give yourself but to then also be able to to see that there's a resonance in every other area of your life whether you you know whether you do something like karate or you play tennis or you love gaming or chess all of those things overlap and you don't need to like none of it is mutually exclusive absolutely I mean this is the thing is you know, you sort of enter into one thing and you get, you, you, I suppose we do like to make sense of the world. So I understand when labels are put on people. I do get it in that as, as human beings, we like to be able to label things so that we can make sense of what we see and what we experience, mm -hmm. right? So the only thing is, is when, when we do that to ourselves, mm -hmm. it can feel suffocating and it can feel that, 
um, oh, well, I can't break out of this. And, and of course, people are multi-dimensional, multifaceted um, individuals. We, we, as human beings, we're naturally drawn to many things. And people say, well, what else do you enjoy? And I said, well, I enjoy many, many things as well. Mm. Am I, do I have the same level of expertise in all of the other areas yeah. as I do in, say, languages or, or you know, other, other areas that I've worked in? Uh, possibly not. But that doesn't diminish the level of interest or or how that actually adds to to me and to my personality. So, you know, what you say, I mean, it, may, it makes complete sense to me. And I think it is important to, to acknowledge, you know, the full, the entirety of, of, of who we are and to, and to recognize, you know, I, I, people come to me sometimes and say, oh, well, you know, I've only learned like one language or two languages. And I'm like, well, do you need to speak more than that? Yeah. My speciality is that I've studied and learned many languages because that's just how my career has gone. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's been necessary for me to be able to make uh, cultural and linguistic comparisons for, for projects, for work. And, and it's also my hobby as well, my main hobby. Yeah. So, and that's fine for me. I would definitely not recommend that everybody needs to do what I've done because it's not relevant to every scenario, right? It's not every, relevant to everyone's um, life. Whereas mm -hmm. potentially doing yoga uh, and then practicing yoga and doing, you know, studying a language, maybe mm -hmm. a language related to yoga, it may be a language related to the place where you practice yoga. Mm -hmm. um, but the relevance and the connections are <laughs> Have you been reading my diary? This is actually something that came up for me based on yoga. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine how spooky that would be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Selena, I'm, I'm getting, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing Sanskrit somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, but it is. It's, it, mm. I think these are the connections that are probably more relevant, right? It's, it's mm. you know, people say to me, well, why don't you learn Swahili? And I said, yeah. well, it's not part of my life. And I, I do find myself answering questions with that, you know, with that kind of answer very often of, well, I don't come across it. Um, I never get to use it. I've never been to the country where it's spoken. And yeah. my connection to that language at this moment in my life is not there. And so it would take a lot out of my day to add that right now in an artificial way and I'm doing that with Korean right now and I can I can definitely tell you and confirm that that is true that it, it, it <laughs> really is it. you've tested the theory yeah yeah I'm testing it for a year and it and it and it's true it's it's a big commitment that it's not a natural thing that comes up whereas a language that many maybe people wouldn't study like Albanian mm -hmm. um you know it's not as popular on the sort of in the language learning community but for me, it's super relevant and really important because it's spoken, um, you know, in the Balkans where I live. And mm. so I, I do come across it and I, I am confronted with the language and I, and I do get to use it in a very natural way. And there is media, just if I turn the TV on, I can listen to channels in the language. Whereas if, you, if you're not connected in any way at all, it does make it a little bit more challenging. It's like saying you're going to be a rock climber, right? And I want to find <laughs> mountains and you live in the Netherlands. It's, yes. you, know, you know, great. You may want to go to <laughs> rock climbing things. You might have to go on holiday, but you need to make more of an effort than you do for say, I don't yes, know. 100%. It's canal it's swimming. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like wanting to be a surfer, but you live in a landlocked country like Switzerland or something um compared to living five minutes from the beach in australia <laughs> and, and then being sad because you don't you're not as good a surfer as those australians mm -hmm. or you know it's I, <laughs> I guess those comparisons are really handy because it's true um yeah. like you say i want to be a train driver but i'm from iceland and i live in iceland where there are no trains uh, <laughs> <laughs> the career is not going to go very far <laughs> the sky's the limit you can always move where but yeah <laughs> it's uh there's there's definitely some realism that needs to be taken into account <laughs> yeah uh, uh, this is it exactly so i mean and you you've been working i think in behind the scenes on sort of this and developing these ideas and these thoughts so tell me a little bit more about your projects and what you've been working on because i've i've seen your site uh but sort of i 
I'd love to know sort of how that's sort of started and developed and sort of what what you do now to sort of to help other people, I guess, because this is what you do. You're an ambassador as well on, on the language learning circuit. And this is why you have the social media presence and, and why you're so good at it as well, because you you encourage other people and bring them out, right? So, so oh. tell me more about how you've been doing this. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. Um, well, where to start? Where to start? I think when I started my channel, or actually, I feel like maybe it's, once again taking it back because not everybody probably knows me hello everybody new <laughs> <laughs> um but i feel like it's really important to probably start with how and why i got into the language space and it was very much like you mentioned beautifully about a natural development of interests and, and relevance that kind of happened to me and i think i grew up in australia so most people don't make that connection between the relevance of, of multilingualism and Australians for some reason. But I, you know, I spent the first few years of my life between Latvia and Australia. And for me, the relevance appeared in airports. I would walk past people who were speaking all these different tongues, waiting in line for flights to places I had no idea where they were. And I would always ask my mom, you know, what is this person saying? What is that person saying? I want to know. And so languages for me were the thing that unlocked my, my curiosity for the world and for people. And then when I was about seven, I would say, I kind of became really aware of the fact that, okay, I can speak at the time two languages. And in my school, there were people from France, there were people from Serbia, from Japan, from Nigeria, all in my class. And I found that even learning a few words helped me connect better with people. And I think that for me, everything and anything I do has always been about connection. And it's been about diving in deep and exploring vulnerability, exploring relationships with people and just exploring the world through the lens of others and their culture and their experiences and, and their you know, language background. And so for kind of to tie into what I do today, it's been very much a natural progression of a lot of trial and error. Uh, I mean, when I started, my la I knew I loved languages. That was it. And I thought, okay, how can I take this further? And I never actually wanted to be anything that I'm doing right now. I never even had that notion in my head. I wanted to be a lawyer in the EU. So I went and studied law. I did, you know, um, some German law as well here in Germany. I uh, started to do a little bit of French civil law. And that was the path at the time that I could see, you know, this kind of coach influencer combining different fields into one career wasn't really something that was known mm -hmm. and I feel like my path of my own you know exploration and having no idea of what I'm doing in life has led to being you know which which I'm super grateful for an inspiration for others to realize okay wow I can create a career out of out of all of my passions and kind of helping people to do that. But in terms of my projects now, I have for the last two years balanced a lot of being a, you know, kind of self-empowerment coach and, and confidence and communication coach. So I work with people very much on unlocking their power when they have limiting beliefs, finding the core of those limiting beliefs so that they can progress in their, in their relationships, in their relationship with themselves and in their career. And then also, you know, having my language lang projects, I released two books in the last two years. And one of the key things that I knew I always wanted to do was combine personal development and language learning. And you know how you get that question of why did you start learning languages or, or how do you stay motivated? I honestly, Richard, had to think about this for a, like the more I got asked this question, I sat down and I thought, okay, we've got to come up with something because usually I just kind of answer on the fly of, yeah, I love people, I love connection, I love traveling. But, and I'm, I'm sure this goes for, for you and everybody as well who's going to watch this. It's so much deeper than that because it's not just about learning vocabulary. It's not about the semantics. It's not about the grammar it's about connecting to something bigger than you. And for me, why languages, even though my career is shifting a little bit and I'm doing you know, multiple things, 
they will always be at the core of everything I do because the language space, my language teachers as a, as a child were the first place that I felt validated because I was super, super introverted. And many people don't believe this, but I was shy as a child. I was introverted. I didn't have any self-confidence. And it was almost like this, this divine confirmation. But when I stepped into my German classroom in high school, my teacher was so supportive. And technically I couldn't study German because at my school, you could only do a maximum of two languages. And I had already had two. And so I had to really like fight with the principal to, <laughs> to allow me to follow this passion, but we did it. And it was like, in those walls every Wednesday and Friday afternoon, Richard, I felt like this was a space where I could just be me and I could, I could learn a language that was leading me to a dream that I had when I was 14 to move to Germany and move to Berlin, which is where I am now. And, you know, it was wow. that thing of even though I was, I was 16,000 kilometers on the other side of the world, mm -hmm. every time I would walk past a French patisserie, it was like that confirmation of one day I can do this. There is, there is a life outside of the life that I have here. And that excited me. I even get goosebumps now because I know, wow. <laughs> I know what that, that felt like. And that's why I truly believe that, that nothing is impossible. So when I work with people and everything I create, I just, the, the image that I have in my head is for people to just have that belief, that moment of, I can do this when I thought I couldn't. And to have somebody support you who also believes in you, because I know how much that meant to me when nobody else had the same vision. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's a really nice story. And, I, you know, I think quite inspirational that you fought to be able to study German because you had a vision that you wanted to live in a country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I really, really like those kinds of um, you know, stories that, that where you, you just almost have this innate idea of what you want to do and it, it just drives you and pushes you to, to speak up even when you don't feel like you ordinarily would speak mm -hmm. up for, for something. And one thing you said actually just now was about being an introvert. And I get questions quite often from people who say, oh, it's okay for you, you're an extrovert. And, and I guess I am. I was a fairly shy child. Um, mm -hmm when I was very small, um, I, I kind of came out of it because I, I come from a very loud family. So, <laughs> so yeah. if you want to be heard in the house, you, you had to be loud. There was just no way about it. No other way about it. You had to do it. And, and so I, I, I would never, I guess, say I would, I'm an introvert. I think I'm probably more of an extrovert. But mm -hmm. um, when you said that, and, and still you sort of, you've, you, if you haven't watched the video that we made together or you haven't watched any of your videos, anybody out there listening now, you are a really incredible language speaker. Uh, so just need to say that, you know, the languages you speak, you speak them really well. And um, it, it's really quite impressive to, to hear you. And when, when, when I met you in, in, in Slovenia, I was, I was super impressed. So when you said that to me now about being an introvert, I was actually quite surprised, mm -hmm. uh, but also very hopeful because when people say to me that they're introverts and they write and they say, well, you know, I don't like the social contact. And um, we all have different motivations. Like we were talking about different likes, dislikes, different lives, different realities and how we combine them and how we don't need to box ourselves into these sort of pigeonholes that we tend to use um, or other people tend to use for us. And then we sort of almost yeah. submit to them, I guess. Um, mm. That I found really interesting because that answers uh, many of the questions that I get of, is it possible as an introvert to learn languages? And in fact, is it possible for many personality type to learn languages? What do you think? Well, Richard, ah, <laughs> this, is, no, well, this is right up my alley because personality types and, and researching personality is exactly what I've been doing for the last two years. And Anything and like anything and everything to do with the the Myers Briggs, which I know is is there's always of course debate about how accurate it is, but I found that it's better to have kind of a you know a path and a threshold to follow than nothing at all. But the funny thing is, 
every I think extroversion and introversion first and foremost gets it, the meaning gets very muddled up and it's not about being the loudest in the room or versus you know some like not all introverts are shy and quiet not all extroverts are loud and and rambunctious and flamboyant and I mean I'm an extrovert now my my personality type if anybody knows is, is an ENTP so it's I think there's about 90 percent extroversion in my test but that was very much something that developed over the years for when I did it as a as a teenager I was very much an introvert and I think the whole time that I actually learned my languages I was introverted and I just remember before any occasion that we needed to deliver a presentation I needed to speak in front of class no I was shy. I had to mentally prepare myself for three days in advance. I was in sweats and it wasn't comfortable, but it was through putting myself outside of my comfort zone that I developed that ability to show up. And it wasn't showing up for other people. It was showing up for myself. And it was showing up because this was something that I knew I wanted and that my desired outcome was on the other side of that fear. So it really, for anybody, regardless of what your personality type is I think I've seen particularly with a lot of my clients it doesn't matter what their personality type is everybody if they've never spoken um, to other people in that new language they're going to feel fear and that's natural because it's new and in terms of personality like something I really really want people to understand about themselves is that every personality type has has strengths and weaknesses and that's why it's so important to understand yourself better because when you understand yourself you know exactly what your tendencies are um obviously we all we all have been conditioned in different ways and we learn from other people but when you have when you understand your natural preferences you know that even if you're introverted or you're extroverted or you're more of a thinker rather than a feeler all of those have so many beautiful strengths that you can really own in on. Yeah, I think this is the thing is knowing yourself and knowing what works with you and what works for yeah. you and knowing what will motivate you, what will spur you on. Yeah. It, often we, I think we, what we tend to do is, as individuals is we see other people and try and model ourselves on other, individu on other individuals. And that's the key, an individual modeling themselves on another individual who potentially is driven and motivated by completely different things. Exactly, exactly. We can take elements perhaps that we see and we admire about those people and adapt them. Uh, exactly. Fit. But modeling ourselves entirely, completely and just copying doesn't always work. And I, I know that when people ask me about how do I learn a language and I get that question a lot. How do, I learn, how, do I learn, how do I learn that? And my answers are always, well, which language, first of all? Because um, if you want to learn French and you want to learn Japanese or Korean or um, you want to learn German compared to I want to learn, I don't know, Inuit or I want to learn Welsh or I want to learn, I don't yeah. know, uh, Scottish Gaelic or whatever it is, the answer is going to be very different because the languages like people have different personalities too yes uh, they have different things that are challenging you also have different things that make them challenging to learn because either there's such a wide range of materials that you need to know what you want to choose <laughs> from or there's so little out there that you really need to adapt yourself to the materials yeah. to be able to get out of the materials what you need to make it work so that's the first thing. The second thing that I always find interesting is um, how do you learn? Well, it depends on where you are in your life at the moment and it depends on your situation. It depends on what your current workload is, what your family commitments are, what you're doing, um, just generally where you are in the world. Yeah. It depends on so many things. Oh, yeah. And have you experienced that with, I mean, obviously with the personality is one thing, but situation as well right and being honest about that 100 percent. no that is that is a brilliant point and that's the thing as well when I get asked the question how did you learn all these languages every single one Richard is so different because of exactly that a different 
point of life, like point in my life, different motivations. But I think as well, the key thing is, what do you want to use that language for? Because I very much had entirely different goals when I was in high school, when I was in university, and I learned, um, like I studied French, German, and Italian at university. And the workload and as well the amount of, of effort that I put into each respective one looked entirely different based on my goal. So with German, for example, my goal was to reach, you know, for what I considered a native-like level to live, work, study, and speak in a native speaker environment here in Germany. So I was writing essays. I had, you know, three lessons a week. I then did part of my study program for a year entirely in German. So that compared to, I was studying Russian as well at the time. And I kind of, my, my partner then, and I would speak a bit of Russian maybe a couple of times a week, but that was more of a casual goal. So I didn't have such a high expectation for myself or such a high objective with Russian or Italian at the time as I did with German. And so even now, the amount of work that I put in, for example, with Portuguese, my goal is to be able to speak with my Brazilian friends on a day to day basis. So I'm not like what I'm doing in order to achieve that is entirely different, for example, to when, you know, at university, I needed to write exams and write essays on, on Goethe, two completely different things, which of course call for two completely different methods and resources. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, that, that really resonates with me as well, because that's exactly the situation I've been in, studying at university and then, mm. you know, it, it's it, hard it really, the stuff they put you through. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing is, you know, people say, well, can you, well, can you write? I, I often get asked as well, but can you write your languages? I'm like, well, um, <laughs> I mean, some of the, some of the languages maybe I, I won't write as well, obviously, because I, if you don't need to write them, then um, you don't need to write them, right? But, um, but when you've been to university and you've studied and you had to write your thesis in, mm. <laughs> in the language, and I mean, and I had to write my thesis, and I did one in French, one in Spanish, and one in Italian um, at the university, and they had to be on quite diverse topics. Yeah. And, and then all, all the way through your university course, right, you, you're writing essays, you're, you're giving presentations on various mm. topics. And, and it is a very different way of learning at university, absolutely. Um, mm. And then when you get older, I guess, there are things actually from the university learning that I think when people ask me the question about how do I get over this plateau of yeah. intermediate plateau, they call it. I'm like, well, actually, the intermediate plateau for me is a bit of a myth. Um, do you know it's so weird because I was literally about to challenge you on this, <laughs> on whether it exists <laughs> yeah I, I think, think it's exists. a myth I think it's a myth um, and people ask that question and I always found it very difficult to answer mm -hmm. and I and I, I had a bit of a revelation a few days ago and I, someone asked me and I just think I don't actually know if it exists because it preach it just, Richard, preach it <laughs> yeah it was well, just a case of have have you been through enough topics at a post beginners level where you can, because for me, a beginner level is you're learning little sort of islands of vocabulary and things to say about generally about yourself and your situation, your family and your friends and what you've done and where you plan to go and all these things. And then those things sort of like, if you imagine islands in the sea and you slowly build bridges between them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they're all connected and you can run across the islands and over the bridges in a very fluid way. And that's where this fluency develops. Yeah. You do this yeah. in a very fluid way and you can then use and manipulate all of the islands and the bridges to mm. go from one to the other in conversations with other people. You may make mistakes, it might be fine, but that's when you feel that you've hit this kind of intermediate level. Mm -hmm. But what happens then is there are bigger mountains out there yeah. on other islands that you need to explore. And those things, could be about politics they could be about history mm. they could be about economics it could be about oh a whole range of things even topics we're discussing now psychology um, mm. about things about you know personality types all these types of things are then additional islands that are sort of further out into the sea and to get those bridges out to those islands and to explore them and to know them 
and then to join those into this fluid conversation takes a longer, a longer period of time. And I think that's what we mean when we talk about this plateau is mm -hmm. how many islands have you explored to the point that in pretty much almost every conversation you now have, yeah, it's, it's then advanced because you've explored enough of the outer islands mm. to, to unite them with your inner circle. 100%. And as well, you're very right. It's because then in that stage, you're no longer looking at those islands, you're looking at mountains and the mountains are just going to naturally take more time but if you then are putting in only the same amount of work as you were for exploring the little islands of course you're not going to get up the mountain very quickly it does take you know it takes more work it takes more in terms of work as well i mean more revisitation of older subjects and older topics and as well i think you know everything is so beautiful because i feel like we can to take your analogy we can build a lot of bridges between everything we've said in this in this conversation thus far is also with this idea of fluency fluency is also so subjective we've i think we've had this discussion before as well but for example my my native language i always do this with native because that is also <laughs> open to interpretation but my two kind of mother well my mother tongue is latvian and then english is my, my kind of second native language and yet with with latvian one of the mountains or domains i haven't explored is legal language whereas i could talk to you about you know eu um what are they called for ordnungen now in english <laughs> I, <laughs> see I, love what I, mean? see I, what I, I love that you said that though in english and you said in english i could talk to you about ordnungen <laughs> i love it <laughs> Polyglot problems. Hashtag polyglot problems. But this is this is that wasn't planned, by the way. But yes, this is how the brain works. Is I am fluent in German in legal language because I went and I explored that mountain. Yeah. Ask me in Latvian. I'm going to need to go and, and use a dictionary for a lot of these things. <laughs> yeah, and it's completely normal. And what you just did there with German coming in, I had that with German with um, technical vocabulary. Yeah years ago so sort of in my first roles I had to learn because computers believe it or not were fairly uh, well not a new thing but the um, the internet certainly was pretty young uh, when I started working and um, it still there was no real social media like there is today mm -hmm. and when I when, when I was when I was working um, I had to learn how to use uh, sort of different office programs and things I learned all of this stuff in German first. Mm. And when I went to sort of say things in English, it was a bit stilted because I hadn't, I wasn't used to manipulating the vocabulary in the same way. And sometimes I didn't know, like Steuerung, Steuerung, yeah. um, and Entfernen, and, you know, all these kind of terms that, okay, Steuerung and Entfernen, you, you can just have in normal German language, obviously. Mm -hmm. They, they mean other things. Um, but when, when, when you're talking about computers and windows and you know, where you have to click, and I was like, okay, I, I, they would come up first in German for me. Yeah, like, say, same thing. <laughs> that, that, that reminded me actually of those days where I, I, it would just come up in German. Defragmentierung. Yeah. Das Festblatt, das, oder sowas ähnliches. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this defragmentation, it's like, okay. It didn't really mean as much to me in English when I first, it's a very similar word, but not a word that I ever used in English mm. until, until after I'd learned about it in German. Mm. But it's completely natural. Like you say, um, there are certain words and things that you, you learn and experience in a language and it just, it's mm. like a matter of time. And like you say, fluency yeah. and ability to speak is, well, even a monolingual can be, sort of lost or not fluent 100%, in an aspect yeah. of their one language that they speak. Mm. And I think as well, what's important to mention is, I think that that state of being often gets a negative connotation that very often, whether it be from native speakers or from whoever, that a lot of people see that as a limitation like they try and minimize your character I think in a little bit whereas I think that that's something to draw power from just as I think that having an accent is something to draw power from and in that sense like 
having a, that element of curiosity. So something that I find myself doing as well is um, tra naturally translating metaphors that I would use in like, let's say German or Latvian into English that makes sense in English, but it's not how one would say it. And what I've started to do is, is almost like a little bit of a social experiment, Richard. <laughs> but I've started to, to manipulate some idioms, not because I don't know the idiom in the actual language, but because sometimes as the world, you know, shifts and, and our world is constantly shifting, mm -hmm. who's there to, who, like, who's there to say that you can't manipulate pre-existing norms? Yeah. Because all of things like, yeah, metaphors or idioms stemmed from, a collective norm so mm -hmm. we also have the power to change them and i think yes it might be might not be the way that you would say it or one another person or or the environment that you have been accustomed to would say it in the language mm -hmm. but what if this is a new one that actually says more about that person you know mm -hmm. or mixing up verbs for example like yeah with steuern um like in the car you have the like an auto steuern yeah. we would say like to drive a car not to to lead or manage a car but they both make sense <laughs> yeah, well, it, well it, actually it's funny that example with with manage a car you, in mexico they use this verb uh, maneja uh, yeah and, manejar <laughs> uh, manejar and, and it says you know maneje or maneja or however they use it in there depending on the imperative you're using mm -hmm. but they'll 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 use that word which for me has always been conducir in, in in Spanish, I would I would never say manejar, and and I, I found it, manejar. <laughs> it's it's very for me it sounded very Mexican. I mean, possibly in other countries in in Latin America too, um, but I saw it written down a lot in Mexico, which is I think when you're driving, and I was driving a lot in Mexico, so I, I saw I saw this word written down, and I was like, wow, I never because I've I've never really experienced it in yeah. such a formal way um but yeah you you do and words change and as a multilingual family actually uh, my wife and i we speak macedonian we have done for 15 or so years mm -hmm. um you know as a home language on a daily basis um but the interesting thing is there are some turns of phrase from english that don't exist in macedonian just because mm -hmm. it just isn't that expression doesn't exist there or in English there's not an expression of Macedonian mm. but we we will often make our own Macedonian phrases from English phrases yeah that's and, amazing and sometimes my wife forgets <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that they're just our ones right and so she'll use them and like that you do realize that is English it's just we've translated it into <laughs> <laughs> yeah and she I mean I mean obviously her her Macedonian's excellent she's she's a qualified Macedonian teacher and she's She's uh, studied the language in a lot of depth, so I mean, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of fun. But uh, mm. she, but we do, we do that kind of thing because there are just certain turns of phrase, and you know, you come yeah. across them many, many times, and you, you can't really render them often into another language mm. in the same way. There was a thing the other day. It was one of those, you know, those clear blue skies, but it's very cold. Yes, yes, yes. Winter. In Macedonian, there's a word for that, yasnik, and. Mm. they said well how would you say it in English and I said well we don't actually have a commonly known word for, for this yeah um, yeah I, I don't know how I'd say it in English it's for me it's just in, in my head it's only in Macedonian so I mean when you get onto certain types of terms or things you witness or see or experience sometimes they only do fit in a language and yeah that, really exactly true. and I think that's where the the Beauty is as well when you do speak multiple languages, whether it's two, whether it's five, whether it's 10 or 15, mm -hmm. to be around people who know those, where you have those commonalities. So just like we did then, we can switch and use the appropriate word that we, or the word that we find most appropriate in German, in the middle of a lap, or I was about to say in the middle of a Latvian sentence. <laughs> that too, I do that with my mum. I think that was my brain naturally going to that example. And then into English, you know, and I think there's so much beauty because that is a way of also exploring creativity, being creative with your language. And just as you said, the first example that came to mind for me was um, in Brazilian Portuguese when you're talking about like doing cafone, which is that like stroking somebody's hair and head and mm -hmm. making them feel good. That's just one word. 
So I can easily say, quero cafuné. I just want a cafuné. I want someone to, uh, to stroke, you know, to massage my head. Two words in Portuguese. Yeah. Two phrases in English. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's, it's very strange when you sort of come across these kind of concepts. And, and obviously people write books on this type of thing. I mean, yeah. you know, Alex, Alex Rawlings himself mm. wrote... Um, wrote a book on this as well yeah, I remember yeah and and they are the fascinating um things when you come across these and this is one of the things actually and uh, you know as as an English native English speaker but learning lots of languages people are often shocked when I say how much I love English because mm -hmm. people expect me to hate English and to sort of almost reject it because it, you know the history of the language and how it's dominated the world and and also how so it's been used as a weapon, it's been weaponized, but in a very stealthily way, it's mm. sort of made people almost love it, even though it's been the language to dominate societies. It's a very strange language in that way, English, but there's a lot of beauty in English. And so people often are surprised when I say I really like English because there, it's very accepting of new words and new ideas and new yeah. concepts. It, it just, they flow into the language. Uh, so easily and mm -hmm. if they're used people just say yep that's what we say now and, and that's kind of exactly. it whereas you do get other languages where they, they put these I, I would say artificial barriers between what people want to say and these sort of this so it's kind of a language puritist uh, mm. viewpoint which to some degree I get and not to play devil's advocate to annoy people listening saying <laughs> well we're sitting on the fence a lot like with personalities and like with everything else, I do understand both mm -hmm. camps. And in certain areas, I get why you'd want to be a language purist. Purist, I, I, I do get the purism of wanting to preserve and conserve a language yeah. because what's happened to some languages in the past is they've died out because they've become another language because mm -hmm. the grammar has been diluted to a point where they just speak in the way of another language or you know a majority language and the, and the vocabulary as well and mm -hmm. it's just become a dialect almost of another language and yeah. they've, they've died out over time in that way so i get it i get it to can to preserve to not have you know the sort of linguicide happen where you murder mm -hmm. the language sometimes it is useful likewise it is good to be open because when it, for especially a language like english that hasn't got the fear of linguicide mm -hmm it's quite a nice aspect of it that it's so open to accept everything that it means. Yeah. There's a lot of fearlessness around it then. <laughs> there is. I mean, but if you turn on German TV nowadays, uh, you hear way more English than in the German than you oh, ever did definitely. before. Especially here in Berlin. Um, I've noticed actually the other day I went to, to get a coffee. That's my weekly treat around COVID of everything being closed. <laughs> and Something that I reflected on that I thought, hold on a second, even two, three years ago, this, this wasn't that acceptable was I often use English words like there's Denglish is a huge thing now. I see it on social media. I see it yeah, on the news. I see it in films that, for example, I, I, I said the other day, I have a challenge instead of I have a, I have a herausforderung, but like I have a challenge. And more and more of these English words are being put into everyday vocabulary. Do, do you notice as well a difference? Because this is one of the other things that I, I, I find is with these English words that enter into the vocabulary, there's actually a different feeling around them. So when you said that in German just now, for me, that felt quite different. Mm. To, the two words had a bit of a different flavor to them. Yeah. I don't know whether that's my perceived thing, so I'm not based in Germany and I'm not I've not lived in Germany while that change has happened. Mm -hmm. um, but for me with, for example, I don't know, um, especially things about social media, you know, mm -hmm. a like or sharing, the word share, the verb to share, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a Macedonian word to share, but sheruva is, is obviously taken from the English and maybe mm -hmm. with a, a Slavic Macedonian um, suffix to make mm -hmm. it Macedonian, but it, you can only use it in an online context. So it yeah. has a, a, a sort of, whereas in English, obviously to share is just to share, mm -hmm. whether it's online, offline, whatever it is, it's, it's to share. So I, I, 
I do have this weird feeling when, when I hear these words and I think, does it add an extra element to each language when it comes in if the other word doesn't disappear and fall out of use? Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I feel like there are so many different angles we could approach this from. But with the German, I do think it is very much ingrained yet in the context. So if I, and it's very interesting that you mentioned that because the almost social construct or narrative that would that I think of playing out in my head is I would probably feel nat more natural mixing English and German without having the idea of a native German speaker um, diminishing my linguistic knowledge because I've mixed in these words would be probably around people in my age group or let's say between anything from from 15 to, to 35. Mm -hmm. But then in another context, I would I would never use that language, for example, if I went to the bank or if I was talking to somebody older or if I was talking about something like like a political topic or things that are by society seen to be, you know, advanced topics there, I probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I would stick to, to pure German. Yeah, there is definitely that as well. I mean, we, we have this um, interesting mix here that there's the English, but that we also have a lot of Serbian terms that are used mm -hmm. as well and ter Serbian expressions. We tell jokes in Serbian quite often um, and things that we share on that we share on Facebook or, you know, on, yeah, on, yeah. on social media will often be just fully written in Serbian or Croatian, usually Serbian and Croatian variants, sometimes Bosnian as well. Because uh, yeah. Bo Bosnia's got this really cool, um, you know, sort of fame here as being quite funny, jokey people. They're just mm -hmm. naturally funny people. And um, they, they've got this, the, people love Bosnians uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in North Macedonia. And, and, you know, I mean, you can't help but put up with it, you know, but you can't help but sort of join in with that uh, as, as somebody who, who's assimilated into the society. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, these personalities that we were talking about as learners, I mean, it's been interesting how the conversations developed because yeah. <laughs> just showing how the personalities actually, even in languages themselves, have their own personalities. I mean, not talking about people's personalities and how they potentially change or don't change mm. depending on the languages they speak, but how the the languages are the, have their own personalities themselves mm -hmm. and how they, they adapt. To... Exactly. There's the, yeah, so many parallels between that. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a fascinating chat, actually. And, and, you know, just sort of one other thing on personalities that we haven't touched on so much. Do you think that we change personalities when we speak different languages? Oh, hmm. do we change personalities? I'm also very much a devil's advocate, Richard, so I could, I could argue any point of this. I think... I don't think we change personalities. I'm going to I'm going to say no. But there's a caveat. <laughs> I think that languages allow us to create or potentially feel more confident in exploring our personalities because we don't have such a strong emotional attachment to the language as we would our native language. So we're kind of in the process of learning a language. I do think it's it's very much aligned with a fluid identity and it allows for more fluidity to, to come in and for you to be almost a vessel in, yeah, a vessel of curiosity and exploring, well, how, how do I relate to this language? Or most importantly, how do I want to relate to this language? And I mean, you know, people, we, we all have mirror neurons. So it means that when I'm speaking, for example, with my Brazilian Portuguese friends, I naturally start to mirror their behavior. And, you know, it, yes, it's a, it's a stereotype to some degree, but my friends are very, very loud and very rambunctious and, and passionate. So when I now speak Portuguese, because that is the environment that I've predominantly learned it in, I do feel my, I've almost constructed purposely a different way of being that allows me to interact in the manner that I want to interact. But that doesn't go to say that, for example, if I found that in Brazilian Portuguese, I could explore my introverted side more. So I find that with German, for example, German is a language that I journal in a lot because 
the amount of intricate vocabulary that exists in a language allows me to explore thoughts and put put language to thoughts that I couldn't perhaps in in another language. So I think it's more about creating and exploring different elements of your personality rather than changing it completely. Because I mean, I'm still leaner in every language. And if I don't know how to express a part of me, then I then I find a way or I ask and I develop that. But I wouldn't say that it's it's what I think most people tend to assume is it happens like like a bipolar disorder that yeah. in one language you're like this and then they think of extremes. It's not like that. Yeah, I, I like I, I like the word fluidity that you used um, because obviously we talk it's 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 very I guess really um, you know common word to use in in certain areas nowadays when we talk about um, sexual fluidity, gender fluidity, personality fluidity. I think that you know people go through through changes and phases in different parts of their lives, and to pretend that we are one fixed, set in stone person with a set of characteristics and reactions, and uh, the way we are is exactly the same, identical on a day-to-day -day basis. Emotionally, that that's not true because there's an emotional fluidity as well. There is right. So all of this for me is fluidity. I think is the key in accepting that things change. Is... Accepting that it's a process. Every, mm -hmm. as you said, on a day we can experience a hundred different emotions. Yeah, that's not wrong. <laughs> and, and I, I wonder if, because when people talk about this sort of, you know, different personalities in different languages, for me, I kind of think, am I though? Am I different? Or, or do people perceive me as a different person in different languages because it's through the lens of a different culture? Mm, very true. And, and, and I know that, for example, I have a bit of a wacky personality because I'm, uh, you know, born British. It's kind of, unfortunately, <laughs> you can take the boy out of Britain, but you can't take the, you know, you can't take Britain out of the boy. It's just, it's just okay. the way we are. Mm -hmm. And so this natural thing, my natural playfulness with words, for example, puns, silly things that I will laugh at, mm -hmm. because that's just what, the way I've grown up. Mm -hmm. you can't get rid of that it's just the way it is mm -hmm. unfortunately for my my <laughs> my macedonian speaking self that's not how society works here in the same way yeah. and uh, you know on the whole there are people who are a bit a bit crazier with 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 language and will sort of laugh at similar things don't get me wrong uh, but because it's not as mainstream in macedonian i would be perceived as being a bit a bit quirkier than I naturally would be in English or in maybe French or another language where people do tend to be a lot more playful and laugh at silly things in the language. Yeah. Here I would, yeah, here I would need to, and also, whereas in, in some languages you can just sort of reference something in a very minor way and then jump into your thoughts. Mm -hmm. In Macedonian, I have to preface everything. And, yeah. and, and build up the whole background story. And then I can springboard into what I'm gonna say. So the whole way of building up your conversation is quite different. Yeah. And it's yeah. nothing to do with your linguistic ability. It's to do with a totally different mindset. Yeah. And, and, and categorization, because that's what we naturally do. Our primitive you know, tendency is to navigate the world by categorization, by having stereotypes. So it's not, there's no right or wrong. I think, you know, once again, labeling, it can serve a purpose, but sometimes it can be quite restrictive. And definitely, I think, um, just allowing yourself to explore and in terms of, actually, yeah, I did, a, I did a talk at the Women in Language Conference about this exact topic on language and identity and, in, and understanding that, you know, sometimes the way that we also question other people about their linguistic ability or their or who they are and what they do and where they come from to within ourselves, irrespective of, of the answer that they bring across, yeah. to maybe question a little bit more, why am I asking this question? Because as you said, you know, with, with it there being different kind of things that are accepted in mainstream British culture versus mainstream Macedonian culture, I think regardless of, of linguistic background or cultural background, even though, yes, they play a role, for yourself to question, am I actually approaching this person with a sense of curiosity or am I going already with a 
predisposed idea of this is the society in my in my view where do they fit are they like me or are they different to me mm -hmm. rather than switching it and seeing who is this person how do they present themselves into to it just that element of curiosity yeah. of instead of minimizing their their life experiences and character seeing it as something enriching if mm. it's especially if it's completely different to your understanding of the world yeah i think that's an, it's, it's nice to, to sort of and when we talk about this sort of valuing diversity and sometimes mm. they can be felt as very throwaway very fluffy very sort of where's the meaning in this um and for me I'm, I'm i'm pretty practical in terms of what i what i talk about so when i talk about diversity and things i'm not saying you need to have a representative of every single community mm -hmm. uh, just because you should have a representative of every single community the thing is is that again as individuals we tend to be drawn to people who think in a similar way yeah. and are as a result whether it, and it doesn't really always matter what form or what part of society that person represents in other in other areas it's this thought uh, process that's that the, i guess the personality the thought process that sort of birds of a feather flock together and mm -hmm. whereas this diversity of thought and diversity of of um, you know of, yeah outlook it's actually important because sometimes it will challenge and make us reevaluate yeah. what we saw as a standard and a way of doing things. And uh, whether that's language learning, whether that's whatever it is, um, even if we totally disagree, <laughs> but we can even fundamentally disagree on many things, right, as, as individuals. Mm. And that's fine. <laughs> this is where that yeah. it, it's fine to not agree and it's fine to... To, to sort of, you know, Luca and I um, sometimes disagree on, on some of the methods he uses, I, I couldn't use. Um, it's not that I disagree that with him in fun, you know, in the fundamental way that that doesn't work, Luca. I would, I would say, of course it works because you use it and you're an extremely yeah. accomplished language learner. So of course I, I can agree it works. All I can say is I don't agree with, maybe it may not work for me. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of things, I think it's really important that, that you sort of, we see these differences, we acknowledge them and then we sort of say, okay, it, does it resonate? Does it not resonate? If it doesn't, then we just carry on. And, exactly. And it's fine. And, yeah. And I think it's important there to distinguish that disagreement takes nothing away from your value as a person, no. like your opinions and somebody else's, um, you know, counter opinions are not attached to your value as a person. They're not attached to their value as a person. It's putting everything in the center, exploring ideas and taking away from it, you know, what, what you want to take away from it. Absolutely. And I think this is the key thing, isn't it, is, is that with language learning, and this is the context we're speaking in, of course, I mean, you know, sort of within a language learning framework and uh, with personalities and different things, is there isn't just one true fact that works for everything. I mean, when we talk about sort of facts and non-facts and opinions and facts then obviously sometimes there is a little bit more black and white with this it's sort of it's, it's not as gray the area of, of you know for discussion you can have an opinion of course but when we're talking about language learning it is super super subjective as to how it works yeah and i think this is where the, the kind of thing you're doing and promoting really comes into its own so I mean, it's been an, an amazing conversation with you and really interesting. And I, I found it very rewarding. So thank you, first of all. Likewise, thank but then, you. Where do people find out more? I mean, is there a place that they can go to connect with you? If I mean, unimaginable that they've come through me to find you, but in case <laughs> they have, um, <laughs> is, is there a place where they can find out more and, and, you know, hear more about this and connect with you and maybe learn from you? Yeah, definitely. Well, the first place is my YouTube channel. So Lena Muskis, you can find me on there on Instagram. And as well, yeah, if if for people who are really interested in exploring their own unique talents and exploring how their personality and their psychology influences their, you know, language learning style and they want to be more effective as learners, um, then to go on Learn Like You as well. That's the latest project that I'm launching with my beautiful business partner Hedvig. So can find us on 
Facebook, Instagram as well. And yeah, thank you so, so much, Richard, for having me. It's been an well, absolute pleasure. Well, thank you. And we'll pop the links in the description as well so that people can find them more easily. And um, thank you so much for making time to speak to me. It was a pleasure as ever to talk to you. And um, Likewise. look forward Always to a pleasure. again soon. <laughs>